Dear Father, thank you for another Sabbath you've given us. Uh, we're still in dead smack in COVID-19, but we're so glad that we can continue uh, meeting digitally and even uh, doing a preview of our Sabbath school lesson. We pray that you'll be with us. Uh, thank you for a quarter you've given uh, where we can know some tools we can use to be more effective witnesses for you so we can make disciples of all nations and they too can worship your name. Again, we always pray for teachability and humility so that by doing so we can understand and after understanding we can love what we learn and Put it into our hands and our feet that we might obey your word for us to this end dear father bless us in Jesus' name i pray amen so we've uh, covered chris gone and covered the first lesson with you why witness i i'm going to go over some basic principles as we go through the quarterly uh so why witness is of course that the the main theme of the quarter um I always tell this joke, I might have told it before that it's just so apropos, let me repeat that. There was, there was a pastor who was, uh, he was uh, retiring and uh, of course he saved up. Uh, he had, uh, his wife was working, a you know, very uh, decent job, so he was able to get some nest egg going. And uh, upon his retirement, he bought a yacht and figured uh, he and his wife can enjoy his retirement while doing ministry, still be in their yacht. And uh, that didn't fly too well with the members of the church. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the pastor wanted to be very Adventist, <laughs> what he did, so he named the yacht the Desire of Ages. Uh, but you know, a lot of people smirk in the church, why in the world does a pastor buy a yacht and, I mean, the dust of even call it the desire of ages. And then when the pastor uh, got wind of what was going on in the church, where people were talk, talking about this yacht, he renamed the yacht. Uh, and he renamed it to the Great Controversy. Okay, so I mean, I, I thought that was a neat Adventist uh, humor right there. But uh, it's an introduction to the way we do evangelism and witnessing. Uh, do we present the desire of ages, or do we default to the great controversy? So where you get doom and gloom, mark of the beast, and all those symbols in apocalyptic imagery, or do we present Jesus, the desire of ages? Um, I, I like to submit to you that the, the way we should do evangelism and witnessing is uh, typified in the scriptures, particularly in Acts. It's we have to present the desire of ages in Jesus. Only then can they appreciate that he's coming back and then we can wrestle and grapple with apocalyptic literature. So let me just review the discipleship cycle with you. I know we've covered this before, but it will be a good uh, springboard towards the understanding of what witnessing is about. You know, and some guy who was uh, keen enough uh, to do this, uh, I think very clever, you start by knowing, you know, you know, you know Jesus Christ, you find salvation, and then you grow after you know by attending small groups and discipleship classes. Then, of course, after you grow in your small groups and classes, you begin to reflect what you learned. And then you show that in your life, your spiritual maturity, your servant leadership, while you share your gifts in the church. And, of course, there's a lifestyle witness that comes with it. And then after you show it, you, know, you got, come to a mode where you're showing what you're learning as you grow in Jesus, then you go. You have become more intentional in going to people and meeting them where they are. So you see the cycle of no, grow, show, and go. Uh, our lessons for the quarter, the lessons for the quarter uh, uh, focuses specifically on the go part, the go part of the cycle. I, I put together a more comprehensive diagram, which hopefully will help us appreciate what we're studying this quarter. Okay, so I, I, I use the M's, that way it's a lot easier to remember, and uh, the alliteration will can probably stick in your head while you're remembering this cycle. We, we start with membership, then go to maturity, then ministry, and then missions. Okay, membership obviously is the counterpart of no. You know Jesus through membership, and you become part of the family, 
as soon as you accept Jesus Christ. And then you start studying more about Jesus. You grow in Jesus. You mature. And then in maturity, you then go into ministry. Well, you're learning more about Jesus. You learn more about the principles and his will and the things that you can do to grow the church and develop uh, uh, an evangelistic plan and strategy and share the gospel to other people, then you go into a ministry. You start serving others. That's where you show. Then you go to missions at the back end where you have, you go to reach the world intentionally, going out to the unbelievers out there who will need to hear about Jesus Christ. So like we mentioned in the previous slide, our focus is on the lower left quadrant, which is missions and proclaiming Jesus. That's what we're studying this quarter. Um, but I'd just like to go very quickly to the experience of Jesus in John 4. John 4 talks about Christ's encounter with the Samaritan woman. And I think this is perfect, a perfect template of what it means to do outreach and making disciples of all nations. Uh, before we do that, I want to go back to what we studied last quarter. Again, this is still a Bible study. I hope we do not miss that. And the way to understand the Bible basically is to know the three stories that goes with the Bible. The three stories, again, is their story, which is the story of the original author when the Holy Spirit inspired that writer, that biblical writer. What was he intending to say through the author when the author wrote that portion of the scriptures? Then as soon as we understand the context, the historical background, even the syntax and the words and the language that we use, we then ask ourselves, why did the Holy Spirit give it to the writer? And then we relate it to his story, which is the story of the plan of redemption in Jesus Christ. And then we, we glean some basic principles that is true for all times that we try to follow. And once we get those applicational principles, then we turn into our story, and that our story then applies what we have learned. So always remember our Bible study must cover three stories, which is their story, his story, and our story. And we'll be safe. We will be understanding the Bible in a very sound and correct way. So, so we begin their story. This is the story of what happened in John 4. Uh, Jesus was on his way to Galilee. And if you look at the map, uh, you will see that Galilee is north of, uh, north of Judea. And right in the center of the path is Samaria. And there are no dealings uh, between the Jews and the Samaritans. And one historical lesson, we have to go back to Ezra and Nehemiah, Daniel, or study. You know that in 722, the Assyrians ransacked and uh, 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 practically destroyed the ten tribes, the northern kingdom, the, the two kingdoms after Solomon, okay? the northern kingdom of Israel. What happened was when Assyria destroyed uh, Israel, the ten tribes, he banished those ten tribes from all to all over the place in the Assyrian Empire. Some people chose to stay in the northern kingdom. Meanwhile, Assyria had a bunch of his citizens settled in Samaria. So what happened was there was an intermarriage between the Jews and the Assyrians. And the place became known as Samaria. And of course, the product of those intermarriages became Samaritans. That's why the Jews hated the guts of the Samaritans because they're half-breeds. So to a point where when you see this geography, when people go from Judea to Galilee, they do not go through Samaria. They avoid Samaria altogether. They veer towards the right so that they can avoid associating with the Samaritans. In this particular case, Jesus did not do that. He went smack straight into Samaria because he wanted to have an appointment with the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. So this is what, this is what the Bible says. Uh, and I saw another angel, we know that, in Revelation 14, 6, flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to whom? To those who dwell in there, to every nation and tribe and language and people, no discrimination. The gospel is for everyone because all have been afflicted by sin. So what Jesus was trying to demonstrate was, hey, you hate the guts of the Samaritan. It's off limits to you. You don't even want to touch them. I'm telling you what. I'm going to go there. I came to seek and save that which was lost. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go there 
and bring the gospel of the kingdom to the, the Samaritans. So while Jesus was sitting by the well, Jacob well and sent his disciples to buy some food. A woman uh, from Samaria came and to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink for me, a woman of Samaria? Right? Three things going against this uh, Samaritan woman. Number one, of course, it was a Samaritan, and the Jew had no dealings with the Samaritan. Number two, she was a woman. Uh, being a woman during the time of Jesus in Jesus' culture did not uh, occupy the best place in society. In fact, a rabbi was not supposed to speak to a woman in public, even if the woman was a member of his family. I think in one of the commentaries of the Jewish literature, they're saying some of the rabbis had bumps on their head. You know what? Because if a woman shows up in public, they had to close their eyes. And while they keep their eyes closed, they keep on hitting the walls. And by hitting the walls, they have bumps in their head. That's what they're saying. So the fact that she was a woman is another point against her. And more than that, uh, people normally come to the well at early in the morning or late in the afternoon so that they avoid the scorching heat of the sun. <laughs> this woman went there at noontime because she had a problem with her, her reputation. So she was a Samaritan, she was a woman, and she was a woman of ill repute. <laughs> Jesus said, doesn't matter. It's part of the world. She needs to hear the good news of salvation. So we go to the command in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, it says, so wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, teach them to do everything I have commanded you. Remember the command in Matthew 20, for the longest time, you just followed the, the words and the phrases in Matthew 28, and we think that the command is go. So we obsess into going to the mission fields and obey the command that, hey, we should leave what, wherever we are and go. But the literal translation is, so wherever you go, as you go, it doesn't matter. You don't have to go to another land. You can be going down the street to the store or going to your office. While you're going, the main verb of the passage is to make disciples. And this should happen to all the nations. So wherever you go, you happen to go abroad and you hit some, uh, some people, then you make disciples out of them. You know, once given the opportunity. So Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Jesus said to her, uh, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. Um, you will notice that uh, this woman is not the most ideal family life she was living in with another man who doesn't happen to be her husband. So she was in a very immoral state. The, the immoral state that she then is basically against the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. And the Samaritans recognized the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, as their Bible. It was sacred to them. And because the Decalogue was relevant to the Samaritans, the lifestyle that she was leading wasn't too cool, it wasn't too appropriate to a lot of the residents of Samaria, even among the Samaritans. So we come into grips into exactly what the gospel is. What did Jesus give this woman? Um, notice he did not just say, hey, you will have a, a better life if you accept Jesus Christ, or accept me. Uh, <laughs> Jesus asked the woman, Hey, what kind of moral life are you leading? Hey, go call your husband. He was convicting her because he needed, she needed to be convicted in order for her to realize that she needs forgiveness and acceptance before Jesus Christ. So we, we go come into grips with what the gospel is, of course. The gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion, coming from two words, a split of you and angelion. You is good, you know, euthanasia, eulogy, uh, and angelion is news. The basic meaning in the New Testament culture of the Galleon is the announcement of the accession or birth of a king or an emperor. Now that we have a good 
we have, we have a new emperor, a new president, a new, a new leader in the empire or in the state or in the country, then there's good news. So it's about lordship or the leadership of some very prominent figure that goes into the good news. And that kind of goes with what the gospel was at, as it was preached in, in Acts. You know, there are six gospel sermons in Acts, in Acts 2, 3, 4, 10, 13, and 17. Um, and a lot of times when we present the gospel, we tell people, hey, you, you obey the gospel, you follow God so that you will not burn in hell or you will go to heaven. So either it's the promise of the gift of heaven or a life, a fire insurance against going to hell. But you will be surprised that in all the six gospel sermons in Acts, hell and heaven are not mentioned at all. So the proclamation of the gospel did not even touch on eschatology or the last day events. Surprise, you know, typical Adventist approach goes to prophecy, to the last days right away. We talk about hell and heaven and what's going to happen in the end times. When in fact, the proclamation of the early church did not even mention hell or heaven in those sermons. Sin was mentioned twice, Jesus' life four times, Jesus' death nine times, the resurrection 15 times, and the Lordship of Jesus Christ 10 times. So the fundamental declaration in the New Testament, for somebody who wants to be saved, is to confess Jesus as Lord and believe in his heart that God raised him from the dead, then he will be saved. So salvation was not this just say, hey, you'll be forgiven of your sins, you'll have a good life. That's not the issue. The issue is Jesus has been proclaimed Lord because Christ, God raised him from the dead. He is now Lord of all. You can you should bow your knees to him. And if you confess that he is now your Lord, and that he, he was raised from the dead by God, and you accept what he has done for you, for your forgiveness and for your acceptance, then you will find salvation. So these are the, the different gospels available to us that's being preached today in contemporary Christianity. There's the gospel of forgiveness only, grace, 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 and then grace is very important. Without grace, we won't be here. It will be grace that will lead us home as the... As the as the song goes, the most amazing grace that saves us, wretch like me, is the same grace that leads me home. Unfortunately, a lot of people who preach this gospel of forgiveness only do not go to verse 10 of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yours, lest any man should boast. And verse 10 says, you were made for good works. You know, whereas the declaration is Jesus loves you and he's, Yes, he died for your sins. There's a component of the Christian life of being a disciple that says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what's the result? Following Christ is optional. And there's a passive sanctification. There's no active involvement in the kingdom of God. There are people who say that the gospel is social action. It's social action because there's so many hypocrites in the church. The gospel doesn't benefit society. It's pie in the sky by and by. You, you, you have no relevance to the people around you. And what happens then, as a result, uh, this gospel accommodates to culture, truth becomes optional, and you really can't know because you concentrate more on what you can do to people in philanthropy or social action and emphasize less of studying and understanding God's words and God's principles in the Bible. There's also got the gospel of entitlement, which says, claim your rights. Now that you've accepted God, you should be entitled to so many blessings in your life. This results in the management of God. You play God yourself. And a lot of times you exploit God because the life, the Christian life revolves around you, not so much the glory of God. And a very close, uh, close relative of the gospel of entitlement, first cousin, is the consumeristic gospel which means the gospel is there to meet your needs. It will result in self-indulgent impatience and addiction to desire. If you accept Jesus Christ so that your needs are met, and the only reason why you're here is so that uh, God can be your waiter, your divine waiter, or your, uh, your, your cosmic therapist, just because you, 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 you don't spend time with him, but if you feel bad, you go to him so that he can give you some therapy, and if he... If you're lacking something, you can come to him so that you can get something from him. You know, consumer, I want to consume something from God. That's going to result in self-indulgence and addiction to desire. 
Then also there's the gospel of morality and correction, which means be good. Do everything you can in order to be saved. Okay, this, is, uh, this, this results in self-righteousness. And the, the other side to this is basically, hey, I'm right and you're wrong. And for the longest time, at least in my exposure, in my experience, the way I approach evangelism was, I'm going to prove to you that my doctrines are right and you are wrong. I observe the right Sabbath on the seventh day. You observe it on the first day. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I'll give you the marks of the true church. These are all the marks of the true church. And we follow this as a denomination. You do not have the marks of the true church. You're a part of Babylon. Get out of Babylon. You come here. So what happens in this gospel is basically saying that my intent and the objective is to prove that I am right and you are wrong. And you join me, you become right and you are saved. I don't think so. You are not saved by intelligence. You are not saved by smart or correctness. You are saved by Jesus Christ, which is the last part, which is the gospel of the kingdom, which says, follow me. You declare Jesus Christ as your Lord. You accept his forgiveness and accept his anointing as your Savior and Lord. And you then move toward service into his kingdom. The followers intent on learning to live as Jesus lived. So, be careful when you share the gospel. Are you sharing some of this counterfeit gospel towards the left? Make sure that you share the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus that declares that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus has been raised from the dead by God. Okay, so aside from being world-directed, the, the, first, the first quality of this witness, it must be directed to the world, to all, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It must be Christ-centered. Right, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus told her, I am he, and I'm speaking to you now. It's amazing. Look at, look at the conversation. Uh, he said, I, I'm, sir, I know that the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming, so I'm still lo waiting for the Messiah to come. Because the Messiah is still coming, you know. I'll do my best to get ready for the coming. Very similar to what we do today. When we equate the gospel with the second coming, so it's a matter of getting ready for the second coming. We miss the power and the motivation for following and waiting for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus was basically saying, well, what do you mean the Messiah is coming? I am he. The Messiah is already here. So by doing that, Jesus is basically saying, the kingdom can be yours even now. Then the woman left her water jar and went back into the city. She told the people, come with me. And meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? He, the woman went and witnessed. And what did she, she do? She said, meet a man. She did not say, hey, learn all these doctrines. Learn all what he's teaching. I want you to meet a man. I want you to meet this Messiah. So the very core of witnessing and sharing and evangelism is to have people meet Jesus Christ. It must be centered on Jesus Christ. These are some quotes from Ellen White, which I've appreciated and has affected my approach in evangelism. The message of the gospel of His grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say that Seventh day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. Ouch, that stinks. Of all professing Christians, Seventh day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. Of all professing Christians, Adventists should be foremost. And lifting up Jesus Christ. Oh, there's no doubt we're foremost in preaching prophecy and timelines and symbols and animals and beasts. But the challenge is, and the call is for us to be foremost in uplifting Jesus Christ. Uh, how I pray for the day, and I'm glad that I see that happening now somehow, even back home in the Philippines, where people emphasize Jesus Christ first before we look in, in, into any other doctrines. Christ and his righteousness, let this be our platform, the very life of our faith. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. What a challenge! When you start evangelism, sharing the good news or the word of God to people, regardless of the doctrine from Genesis to Revelation, it must be studied in the light, in the context of the cross of Calvary. Big challenge. You, yep, that's why I always ask pastors when I do preaching seminars. 
After you preached today, did you preach the gospel? Did you relate what you were preaching, your sermon to the cross of Jesus? Because if you did not, then you did not center in Jesus Christ and somehow you've fallen short of the counsel that has been given to you. So there's one, uh, there's one YouTube uh, video you would like probably to watch. It's by David Asherick. So look for David Asherick. And the title of this message is A Choice You Don't Have to Make. A Choice You Don't Have to Make. A Choice You Don't Have to Make was preached by David Asherick. I think one of the more powerful sermons that he delivered in Kingsliff Church in Australia. He's now assigned as a pastor in Australia. And he's saying, Jesus is at the center of all our Adventist distinctives. We, we believe in most of the common faith of the scriptures, like the Trinity, the Canon, the Church. We talked about that before. But somehow the Adventist Church have, have distinctive doctrines that's very unique that makes the gospel more beautiful. Okay? And, and uh, the genius of David Asher was he turned all these distinctives into S's. He used, he used S for the alliteration. So we, you talk about the Sabbath, the satanic conflict for the great controversy, salvation, the sanctuary, the second coming, the scripture, the state of the dead and resurrection and spiritual gifts. These are unique to the Advent movement. But David Asherick was saying right at the very center, at the hub, if you were to think of all these distinctives as the spokes of a wheel, at the hub of the wheel is Jesus Christ. Right, there's, there's a nice graphic which I wasn't able to put in here, but if you watch that video just I shared I shared with you, you will see that graphic taking Jesus out of the center. You know what happens when you take the hub out of the center? All the spokes fall apart. And that's what happens. The moment Jesus is removed from the center, all of our distinctives will not make sense. Um, how do I put it? it, it uh, I, I resonated with him so much because I went through the same experience that he did. Uh, David Asherick was saying, when I, when I used to do evangelistic outreach, you can watch his videos, you can see all his evangelistic series. It's available, DVD, YouTube, it's all over the place. He was saying, I was preaching doctrines, and I was preaching Jesus as one of the doctrines. And that's, that was wrong. Because Jesus is not only one of the doctrines, Jesus must be at the center of all the doctrines. Because if you take him out, all those distinctive doctrines, again, fall apart. So, witnessing is not only world-directed, it must be Christ-centered. If you don't center it in Jesus Christ, all your teaching, all your preaching, all your outreach will fall apart. It will be in vain. Okay, the third component, the third quality of Christian witness, it must be worship-oriented, okay? Not only directed to the world, centered on Jesus Christ, it must be oriented towards worship. It's amazing. Jesus goes from, hey, call your husband, and after he says, call your husband, I'm convicting you because you are leading an immoral lifestyle, they turn into a discussion of worship. What in the world is the relationship of worship and morality? Now let's look at the experience again. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that the people must worship in Jerusalem. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for people like that to worship Him. This is classic John Piper, one of the best quotes on outreach and evangelism that anyone can read. John Piper says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Please mark that. As, as we study this quarter, we might think that our chief objective as a church is evangelism and missions. That's a misunderstanding. And John Piper explains, worship is. Missions exist because worship does not. By the time we get to heaven, we don't need evangelism anymore. By the time we get there, everybody shall have been evangelized, they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord. They're ready. To, they're set for eternity. But I tell you what, worship will be there until forever. So the goal of the church is worship. The chief and the man is to worship God and enjoy Him forever. And basically, you know what happens? You, all, you go out there so that those people you will reach will eventually become worshipers of the living God as He has been revealed in Jesus Christ. I always saw this uh, 
slide because that's, that's my kid. My, my son is the worship pastor of Forest Lake. And he pursued his master's in the Weber Institute of Worship Studies in Jacksonville, Florida. And in the process, uh, he became classmates with Laura Story. Everybody knows Laura Story. She was the one who composed uh, Blessings, that very, that very moving song about uh, uh, believing and trusting Christ even in the dark uh, moments of your life. She also composed Mighty to Save, Indescribable. She's a well-known worship leader. In fact, she's a worship leader for a mainline Presbyterian church, right? And so they're contemporary. They, they reach the world. They direct it to the world. And, and of course, they're also Christ-centered. And now she writes a dissertation. I was, I was privileged to have a copy of the dissertation. Uh, Justin pulled some strings called their librarian. It's not yet available. I downloaded the PDF copy of her dissertation. His dissertation is about the training, you know, promoting reverence among worship leaders in North America. And this is what she said. There's a very robust theology of the Presbyterian uh, church in terms of God and his sovereignty and his grace and his salvation. Very reformed. Reformed theology is right there. I believe it is this inconsistency between our theology and doxology that contributes to a lack of reverence in our worship. Our worship must begin by approaching God with reverence. This is the struggle we have today because of the new millennials. Now we got Gen Xers. Uh, Gen Z's, you know, we're struggling to reach our kids who are, they're doing mass exit from the church as soon as they graduate from high school. We've talked about this for the longest time. So we, we have this wave of worship where people are worshiping. We want to be relevant. We change our methods so that it can be more relevant and more appealing to our young people. But in the process of being relevant, that doxology or the praise component of what we do today has compromised our theology. So she concludes, our worship must begin by approaching God with reverence. He must begin with reverence first, not just the excitement that so often comes with a lot of these worship uh, gatherings. He must begin with reverence because without reverence, without worship, you will not really appreciate God is. Is there a biblical basis for this? Oh, yes. Let's read some verses. Uh, Jesus is about to go to Calvary to die for our sins in the Gospel of John. So we encounter the Greeks in John 12. They were looking for Jesus Christ. They wanted to talk to him. That's the last time we hear about the Greeks. Uh, and instead of Jesus going to the Greeks and talking to them, this is what he said. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Note, the question at this moment is why, what is important? Because Jesus is about to die. The cross is upon the world so that the world can be redeemed by the Son of God. And Jesus talks about glorifying God or worshiping him. In fact, he continues, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. What is Jesus trying to say? The important thing is not so much just the salvation of the world. The important thing is to show the glory of God. What is that glory? That glory is the glorious love of God who is willing to lay down his own life that we can be saved. That's why we have, we have the, the, the famous quote from Ellen White that says, there was a deeper purpose behind the cross of Calvary, and that's the vindication of God's character. That's another phrase to say, the deeper purpose is the worship of God. Ephesians 2, 7 says, So that in the coming days, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What was the purpose? So that everyone will see the immeasurable riches of his grace in Jesus Christ. And that shows in Revelation 14, 7, when we go to the the angel's messages, what does it say? And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Proclamation, particularly in this last days, contextualizing the three angels' messages, you've got to be an Adventist as you can, is oriented in worship. Worship is the orientation of our proclamation. And John Piper basically says, if we don't, 
want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. So it's very important. The gospel is supposed to convert people. And one of the marks of true conversion is a total abandonment to God. And that only happens when God becomes the object of your worship. Because whatever you worship will get everything that you have. So it should not only be world-directed, Christ-centered, worship-oriented. More importantly, it must be satisfaction-driven. Okay, when I say satisfaction-driven, it's actually passion-driven. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never become thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give them will become in them a spring that gushes up to eternal life. The woman told Jesus, Sir, give me this water, then I won't get thirsty or have to come here to get water. Um, so, Jesus basically saying to the woman, Hey, you're coming here, the heat of noonday, thirsty, you want to quench the thirst within you. I'm telling you, you have a thirst deeper than the physical thirst that you're experiencing right now. Your thirst is really a spiritual thirst. And if you only knew who's the one talking to you, you will ask him of water and he will give you water. A water that you can drink and you will never thirst again. And the woman said, please, please, sir, give me that water. Then I won't get thirsty anymore. I have to come or I have to come here to get water. What's this thirst that needs to be quenched? There's only one text in the Old Testament that comes very close to Revelation 14.7, which is the proclamation of the first angel in, in Revelation 14. Uh, which says, fear God and you know, give glory to him for the hours of but In Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, it is fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole of men. This is the whole purpose of men. For every work that God bring into judgment, there goes judgment again. What are we saying? When did Solomon write this, this chapter? He wrote this chapter at the end of a lifetime of research with all the resources that you had, he had, all the riches and the wisdom that he possessed. He wanted to pursue happiness. He wanted to pursue happiness, and yet, after with all the accomplishments, after accomplishing all of this, he had like 700 wives, 300 concubines, built buildings, so many projects. He was wise as the most intelligent in all the world. He calls everything vanity. And he said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. The purpose of man, the chief end of man, the whole of man, we are here to fear God and to worship Him. You don't worship Him, you will not find joy and you will not find happiness. So, let's come to grips with this. When you don't find joy, you'll find your existence vain. There'll be no meaning. Uh, is that happening today? It's one of my favorite characters in Greek mythology is Narcissus. You know who Narcissus was? He was cursed with a curse that he was uh, one of the most beautiful creatures on earth. And then he went down the stream. He looked at his reflection in the stream. He became so enamored with his reflection. He kept on looking at himself until he died. That's why we have a term, narcissism today, which is an extreme fixation with oneself and one's public perception. Um, Maddie Montgomery always says that the primary deception of our parents during their time was the prosperity gospel, particularly those who moved from a third world country here to the Western world. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. My, my kids, I never enjoyed this in my life. When I have my kids, they're going to enjoy it. I don't want them to be deprived. So he was looking for prosperity, whatever, whatever it took. But they say today, now that these kids of these boomers have experienced the prosperity that their parents were giving them, the deception is no longer prosperity. The deception is the popularity gospel. Uh, and unfortunately, C.S. Lewis says, if you keep on looking for yourself and your popularity, you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, and decay. But look for Christ and you'll find Him and with Him everything else thrown in. Let's process this. People have become more narcissistic today and more connected with aggressive self-promotion. <laughs> it's happening in Facebook, looking for all the likes and you know, however many follow you in Twitter or Instagram. Uh, that's that's self-promotion, basically, the popularity gospel. That is why in the competition for hearts and minds, Facebook is killing God. <laughs> and because of our trend on concentrating on ourselves, what's going on? The world is drifting 
farther away from happiness and people become lonely. Uh, in fact, even before COVID-19, it was interesting that UK, the United Kingdom, established another ministry, Tracy Crouts, right there, uh, under Secretary of, for Sport and Civil Society, has been appointed Minister for Loneliness of the United Kingdom. Because one of the problems they had, even with before COVID-19, was loneliness. And they needed somebody to be full-time in addressing the malady of loneliness among the Britons, at least. That's why I love uh, John Piper's book entitled Desiring God. Happiness and holiness are inseparable. True holiness is unattainable without true happiness. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. The, the essence of worship is found in Psalms 37, 4, one of my favorite verses in the scripture. Delight yourself therefore in the Lord and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Happiness does not come by pursuing happiness. Happiness comes when you pursue God. The moment you pursue God and you find delight in Him, then all your desires will be given to you because it will be channeled to the right direction. The reason for your existence and why you were made by God in the first place. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That's a summary of worship. So many Samaritans from the town believe in Him because of the woman's testimony. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. I understand. The woman right away left. A woman of ill repute. People disdained being associated with this woman. But nothing stopped her. She told everything about Jesus Christ. And if you read the passage, Jesus stayed another two days in Samaria off limits to the Jews. By staying there two days, more and more people listen to the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And they said eventually, and we have heard because we ourselves, not just the woman told us, we listen and we experience the gospel of redemption. The ultimate uh, end of witnessing is basically people accepting Jesus Christ and becoming his worshiper as well. So, you know the story about uh, Phil Vischer, told you this before. But I always plug the Zen when we talk about outreach. The impact that God has planned for us does not occur when we are pursuing impact. It occurs when we are pursuing God. So in the next 12 lessons that's left in the quarter, the way to be a successful witness is not to pursue evangelistic strategies and obsess on what you can do to reach out to more people. The most important thing to do is to pursue God. The moment you pursue God, He will lead you into the right path of reaching more people and making them disciples for him. So that being that with that background, for there are four qualities of outreach. What we say is world directed, it is Christ centered, it's worship oriented, and satisfaction driven. As long as you see all those four, you will have a some hangers or holders, you know, to use in order to be an effective witness for him. So the study for the week is a winsome witness, which is the power of personal testimony. Very quickly, um, we will look into the four parts of personal testimony. I'd like you to look at the board for a while. I kind of wrote this. Uh, there has been two waves of philosophy, worldviews that has affected us and the culture we're living in today. What we call postmodernism and post-truth. Postmodernism is the true the, the, the teaching that there's really no there's really no truth. What's true for you uh, may not be true for me, but that's okay. It, there's really no objective truth. You, you know how how that fell apart, right? That the won't fly. Somebody comes to you and say, "There's really no objective truth." You ask the person, "Is that an objective statement?" You know, you just turn it back to him. So uh, because of that, a lot of people have lost taste. In postmodernism. Uh, and in 2016, the Oxford Dictionary chose one word that was used more times than any other word, word in the English world, speaking world. It's post truth. Post truth is now, as opposed to postmodernism, post truth recognizes that there is truth, there is objective truth. The only thing is my emotions and my preferences takes precedence over 
truth. Uh, and Abdul Murray, there's a very excellent uh, book on this, Saving Truth. You can follow him in YouTube. Look for Abdul Murray. He's, he's now in charge after Ravi Zacharias passed a few weeks ago. Uh, excellent lecturer, I mean, the caliber of Ravi. He describes this. Today, the world is confused because we've left clarity. Okay, let, let me explain that. He's the, the very powerful illustration of Ravi when he was still alive, shared with Abdul Murray. You're driving into Chicago one night on the south side. And while you're driving into a very narrow street, you just discovered that you ran out of gas. So your car stalls in the middle of this narrow street in a dark night in the south side. Don't know what to do. No gas station in sight. And then you look and you see four people, four men approaching your car in the dark. And you're gonna move because you have no gas. So the question they asked was, would it help to know that these four men came from a Bible study? <laughs> of course, no brainer, of course they came from a Bible study, they're gonna help you, they'll get gas for you. So basically, will these four men be harmful and dangerous if they study the Bible? No, no, it is very clear they'll be helpful. But no, what does our culture say? Oh yeah, uh, they'll be dangerous, they'll be intimidating. If I were a woman, if I were gay, and if I were Muslim. <laughs> Let me explain that. Our culture of confusion says, hey, it's okay to be confused with your gender. <laughs> in fact, I, I thought in England, they allow little children to choose their gender. <laughs> I, I may be a boy, but I feel like I'm a girl. You know, so just, you get confused. You don't even know what your gender is. So because you're, you're willing to do that, you become a hero. And then the guy who's very clear on this, based on God's word, dude, even the electrical plug <laughs> tells you that there's a distinction between a male and a female plug. And that goes with the physiological system and the makeup of our bodies as well. So, hey, if you're a boy, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're a girl. Be a boy, be a girl. That's clear. Nah. That's bigoted. That's what the culture says. And then morals. Uh, nuts. Made a mistake. You were not careful. Now my girlfriend's pregnant. Oh boy, that'll be very inconvenient. You won't be able to finish school. I mean, I look all the complexities that that's going to bring. Let's abort the kid. So we killed the unborn. Abortion comes into the picture. And that's okay. Because if you are very considerate with the situation, you become progressive. Because the morality that's dictated by the situation lends itself to abortion. That's the confusion. Because if you ask the person, it has been proven that there's heartbeat of the fetus inside the womb of that woman. And because there's heartbeat, there's life. And you kill that, that's murder. No, the situation calls for getting rid of the kid. That's progressive. And somebody who's very clear saying, if there's life, you end that life, that's killing. You're regressive. Hey, go to religion. No, no, it's all, all religions go to the same place. You know, you might do it different ways, but uh, eventually you'll end up with God. So, so what you go, be tolerant. Well, it's amazing. Uh, some people who are very clear, I can be. Because if you talk to a Buddhist, the Buddhist will tell you, really, the end is to get rid of yourself. And there's really no God. Uh, the moment you go to nothingness, that's the end, then you'll be okay. You will not feel anything anymore. The Hinduists will tell you, basically, yeah, yeah, there's 300 million gods. You can learn how to follow those gods. And then the Muslim will tell you there's really no Christ who died on the cross. How can all of this go to the same destination of the true God? But no, when you say Jesus Christ has an exclusive claim, 
although the claim is the most inclusive claim of all, there's only one way to God. You become intolerant rather than tolerant. What am I trying to say? This is a good intro to what we will cover for next week. So you ask yourself, how, how do I share my personal testimony to my friend or somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ yet? Oh, oh used to be, I, I, share, I share the doctrine. I tell them about the true Sabbath. The, okay, and then I tell them about the state of the dead. Then I start, people don't listen to that anymore. So a friend tells you, oh, maybe the best way to do to do it is give them your experience. And by giving them your experience, they cannot argue against your experience. As I did. One writer said, I did that, and I started sharing my stories. And you know what my friends told me? Oh, that may be true for you, and that's okay, but that's not true for me. I didn't fly. So I said, when he was in the dead end, he tried asking, how do I navigate through this issue that I'm grappling with right now? Well, of course, I've got to go to the Bible, and the Bible helps me out. Is personal testimony valid? Yes. That's probably one of the most effective outreach tools that we can use in order to spread the gospel. But there's one passage in the Bible that allows you to look at what is personal testimony, and that's Acts 26. Okay? Acts 26 is the experience of Paul facing King Agrippa and Festus. And that's probably the template used by most missiologists today in giving a personal testimony. Let's read part of it. Let's, uh, the first part is pre-evangelism. How do you, in your, this is the component, the part of your personal testimony. Before you do anything, there must be pre-evangelism. There must be a bridge to Jesus Christ. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made this defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa. I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O King, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? What's, what's going on in here? You go back. King Agrippa tells Saul, go ahead, uh, make your defense. The first thing that uh, Paul does is he stretches out his hand. That's a gesture of an orator and becomes more gripping because Paul w was in chains. He had chains in his arms and in his hands. Can you imagine he was doing an oration, a speech before King Agrippa with the chains and while he was raising his hand. That's the way you talk if you're an orator. So you go with the comment. There must be respect in sharing your testimony. You must understand, you must have respect to the one you're talking to. It's not approaching them. Hey, Nats, really? The Catholics are part of that false movement in the end. So I'm, I'll start by hating on you so that you become like me. No. Start with the common ground. Start with respect. Okay? And this is what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 20. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. We got to pursue relevance. When I say pursue relevance, we got to have a platform where will they start talking to us. If Paul just went ahead and with this defense without even honoring the position of King Agrippa and following the protocol of or oratory during his time, I was a slap on the face of those who were listening and people will not listen. And that's the point. I, I'll be going to my soapbox again. So I'm very open-minded when we do church, we do missions. So there can be some changes in our music and the way we do church. The reason why we do that is so that we can be relevant, so that there can be a breach for people listening, so that when the breach is made, they'll be ready to open their ears and you can give them the gospel. That's pre-evangelism. And what did Paul say? I have become all things to all people so that I can reach them for the sake of the gospel. So one of the purposes of personal testimony is to establish the bridge. You must incarnate yourself the way Jesus, as God became man. You must be part, you know, be, you be, must be part of the person you're talking to. Okay? After pre-evangelism, the second part of personal testimony is giving your personal testimony. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. 
and not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So Paul, after having the pre-evangelistic bridge, then proceeded to tell the story of his own experience. That's your personal testimony. And then he recalls how he persecuted the church in his old life and how he encountered Jesus. He said, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me in those who journeyed with me. So Paul starts talking about how Jesus encountered him and pulled him out of his murderous spree among the Jews and changed him. So you begin with pre-evangelism and you tell people what you were before and how God called you and God changed you. And like the story of the demoniac in Mark 5 who was exercised by Jesus, who wanted to follow Jesus, Jesus tells him, no, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and now he has had mercy on you. One of the best verses for personal testimony and witnessing. What did Jesus say? The best way for you to share the good news and to share me with your friends, your neighbors and family is to go home and tell them what the Lord has done for you. That came straight from Jesus Christ. So has the gospel changed you? Then go and tell your friends, your family, and whoever what the Lord has done for you. So the third part of personal testimony is the actual presentation of the gospel. So you, you, you have a bridge, you have established something in common with your friend or whoever your contact is, and then you tell them about your story and how life was bankrupt and I was going down the skids and Jesus picked me up and he changed me. As soon as you capture their attention, then you describe to them how Jesus actually changed you, how the gospel changed you. And Paul says, this is what said, he eventually called me to be a messenger of his good news. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. How does Paul then describe what the gospel is meant for? And what this gospel played, the role it played, in changing him from where he was before. That's why it's no wonder in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. Although he was defending himself, the personal defense, the personal testimony of Paul basically was saying, I'm here because of Jesus Christ. Which leads us to the last part of personal testimony, which is persuasion. Is there room for persuasion when you do a personal testimony? So the narrative ends. Uh, remember, Festus basically was trying Paul in the incident in Acts. And after the biggest argument, the people, the biggest Festus wanted to please the Jews. Uh, they were ready to hurt Paul, and Paul appealed to Rome. And because he was a Roman citizen, it was a must for him to go and face Caesar, okay? And because of that, Festus was having a problem. I gotta just send Paul with no reason at all. I can't find any reason, no, no fault in Paul. So it was a blessing that King Agrippa came. And because King Agrippa came, it was from Rome, he can now have King Agrippa give license for him to bring Paul to Rome. That was the background. So Paul talks to King Agrippa in the end of his personal defense. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe, he says. And Agrippa said to Paul, in the short time would you persuade me to become to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for this change. What did Paul say? Not only you, king, but everybody in my hearing right now, 
because Jesus has changed me. Jesus has the power and the salvation. I'm praying and hoping that you too will believe him and you'll be changed like me. So if you go back to a study of John 4, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to them, to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So when you share your personal testimony, there is room for telling people, you too, you come. I found Jesus. You can find him too. And that's the fourth element of a personal testimony. Um, which leads me to the last slide. And maybe I'll give you some more pointers before we end with this. Uh, Galatians 6.14 says, at the end of this very powerful and dynamite epistle of Paul, he says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul is saying in my personal testimony, far it be for me to boast except for the cross of Jesus Christ. What matters in what I say, even in a personal testimony context, is the cross of Jesus Christ, not me. So let's, let, let's be very frank and attack this head on. The biggest problem I have with personal testimony is once you hear this personal testimonies in gathering, it tends to focus the attention of people who are listening to the one giving the testimony. And I've seen this so many times, so that after the meeting, people will approach and say, wow, you are so great. So the focus and the center of attention becomes the one testifying rather than the person he was testifying to, who happens to be Jesus Christ. And that again violates what Paul says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ. How do you remedy this? I'll give you some a suggestion. And I read this a long time ago. It has helped. If you happen to be requested to share your testimony in church, just to be on the safe side, you don't have to do this all the time. He said, make sure that you intentionally start your statement with Jesus or God instead of I, me, and my. Instead of personal pronoun, you start. So instead of saying, oh, I was really down the skids, I was having a problem with my life, and I met Jesus. Okay, let me rephrase that in the suggestion that said, Oh, Jesus saw me. I was in the gutters. I was in the sewer. And Jesus saw me. He took pity on me. And you know what? He called me to himself so that I can encounter. You see the difference? In the first example, I was emphasizing what was happening to me. And people were focused on me, my experience. But the second approach was, a focus was on Jesus Christ watching me in my sin and saving me from our sin. So, if there's one guideline I'd like you to remember, at least for the lesson this week, when you give your personal testimony, be more intentional in centering it in God and Jesus Christ rather than yourself. That makes your testimony Christ-centered and worship-oriented, and that becomes very powerful. Leads me to the last illustration. Jerry Bridges is one of the most respected probably one of the most effective practical theologians of our day. He passed in 2016. Uh, he was with the navigators for the longest time. And navigators are very, very good when it comes to Bible studies, small group, you know, materials. And Jerry Jenkins was very, very emphatic on this. He said, preach the gospel to yourself. Oh, yeah, you want to preach the gospel to people by... Uh, evangelism by a personal testimony. Go ahead and do that, but don't ever forget to preach the gospel to yourself. You've got to preach the gospel to yourself first before you can preach it to others. It's funny when Jerry Jenkins died and there was a funeral conducted in his honor. I watched the memorial service about, I don't know, 60, 90 minutes. It's very moving. And what, this is what caught me. I don't know if you've been asked by your friends in church, fellow members. What do you want to see on your tombstone? I mean, if somebody were to write a eulogy, a obituary for you, what do you want to, people to hear about you? 
when you're dead, you're on the casket lying right there. What will they say about you? And then you kind of stress out, yeah, I got to live my life straight. So that when I die, that would be a nice funeral. Because even during our funerals, we think about ourselves. You know, and how selfish the human nature is. It was amazing. Before Jerry Bridges died, he told his friends, I want you to speak in my funeral. He named the people who's going to be talking during his memorial service. I only have one stipulation. Do not mention Jerry Bridges, but mention Jesus Christ. Oh, and one part of the memorial service was a prayer partner that he had, a Christian leader in his own right. And he said, oh, my Jerry is giving me a very difficult time right now because I can tell you so much about Jerry and his impact among Christians and the life that he led and the books that he wrote. But I promised him before he died that I will not talk about him. I will talk about Jesus Christ. That hit me. Very powerful testimony. From then on, I did not stress out about my funeral anymore, you know. I really don't care. I hope that uh, when they do my funeral someday, it will not be about me. It will be about Jesus Christ. In the same token, you who are contemplating on doing personal testimony as part of our lesson for this quarter in sharing the gospel, I hope you will prepare for the personal testimony and train yourself as a disciple to share your personal testimony, not to lift yourself up, but to lift up Jesus alone, who promised us that if we do, he will draw all men to himself. And once it happens, I promise you, I promise you, you share Jesus with your friends and lift him up. And once you see your friend accept Jesus themselves and make him their Lord, there is no joy that can compare to that. You know, I, I always pray when I kneel down, pray for my friends, pray for my family. And the gist of my prayer is this, Oh Lord, please give them a heart for you. And that's my challenge to you right now. You want to share your personal testimony? Reach out to friends. I have to start with the prayer. Lord, I'm going to speak with my, my, my friend right now. Please give him a heart for you. And when he does, along with the angels of heaven, you will rejoice and find true happiness in seeing somebody become a disciple of Jesus and ultimately his worshiper until forever. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this lesson that we covered. One of the most uh, effective means of sharing the gospel is sharing our own stories through personal testimony. Thank you for the guidelines that we saw in the experience of Paul. I only pray that while we look at the way we do personal testimonies, that we will not drift into the error of having the focus pointed to us, but rather teach us through the Spirit to make our personal testimony centered in Jesus. And as we lift him up and what he has done in our lives, may other people see him and encounter him and allow him to be the Lord of their lives as well. To this end, dear Father, may you bless us. And as we teach our classes this weekend, we study our lesson. May we truly testify of your goodness and grace that Jesus might earn the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.